This video is brought to you by NVIDIA and the brand new MSI GP66HX laptop, one of the sleekest, most feature-packed laptops to support an RTX 30 series GPU. Click the link below to check it out or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gotham Knights has had a bit of a rough run in the lead up to its release. Not everyone has been won over by the trailers or the release gameplay, and the game has also copped a few delays, which tends to make people a little jittery. The biggest hurdle that this game has had to clear though was its lineage, which is that in many people's minds, this is a sort of follow up to the Arkham series from legendary developer Rocksteady. The general reasoning goes something like, it's Batman adjacent, it's made by Warner Brothers Montreal, who did make Arkham Origins back in 2013, Therefore, it's carrying the Arkham Legacy forward into the next generation. I can understand how people have come to this view, but I've never subscribed to that myself. I've always viewed this as a totally separate video game with totally different objectives. And I view the Arkham Legacy as one that's nearly impossible to live up to because Rocksteady are really, really, really fucking good at what they do. And just because another developer takes up the Cape Crusaders mantle doesn't mean they also take up the lofty expectations that fans might have for games set in Gotham City. It's a good thing that I've never subscribed to that perspective because it's already pretty clear to me that Gotham Knights is some distance from Rocksteady's masterful trilogy. I don't mean that pejoratively necessarily because Gotham is aiming to be a very different experience to what the Arkham games were. It's more comic book, more jokey, more colorful. It's co-op. It's got a weird loot game where you bust open chests to find currencies and upgraded weapons with elemental alignments and all that sort of stuff. So Gotham Knights is trying to be its own thing, and that's largely what I mean when I say it's some distance from the Arkham series. But yeah, I do think it's also some distance in terms of quality, in terms of how good the combat is, world design, and in particular, immersion. Unpacking the genius of Rocksteady's trilogy is an entire subgenre of YouTube essay. I'm not going to do it now, but there were like a billion things in those games that worked perfectly, and chief among them was a sense of immersion, of sinking deep into the Batman fantasy. Hell, you want to know where the it makes you feel like Batman meme came from? That was the Arkham series. That's how powerful those games were. And Donkey, playing through two and a half hours of Gotham Knights, I couldn't see the same power coursing through it. But important caveats before I get into my more detailed impressions. First and foremost, I was playing this through a cloud streaming platform known as Parsec during my hands-on session, which is kind of like Google Stadia, except that it still exists. The servers were hosted far the fuck away from wherever I am because I was suffering through massive latency to play this. That is why you'll see some absolutely horrific gameplay here because yeah, trying to perfect perfect dodges with a one second input delay is very tough. That definitely had an impact on how combat felt for me, but most of my thoughts about the combat aren't really about feel. They're more about movesets, animations, gear, enemy design, stuff totally unaffected by latency. Secondly, I played through four specific sections of the game only with a mix of open world exploration and linear missions. I also got to see a good chunk of story stuff, but obviously I only got to see around two and a half hours of what is probably a 15 to 20 hour game. So just a reminder, these are impressions. I got a sense of what was going on here, but I'm not coming to any final judgments about the game. I'll do that when I play through the full experience when it launches on all platforms bar the Switch on October 21st. All right, so that's the intro block. Let's get into some detail and unpack what you can expect from Gotham Knights. <laughs> Batman is dead, exclaimed Jeff Keighley gleefully on stage at the Summer Games Fest earlier this year. With Batman gone to that big bat cave in the sky, it falls to his protégés to take up the defense of Gotham. There's Nightwing, formerly Robin, who became a little too badass for that short cape. There's Batgirl, Commissioner Gordon's daughter and librarian, I think. There's Robin 3, the youngest, smallest, and sneakiest of the lot. And then there's Red Hood, who is a literal zombie. Not literally, of course, but he has been brought back from the dead and he really loves braining people. So you can forgive my exaggeration. Now, listen, I'm not a Batman dude. I have a few thousand Marvel comics packed away in my closet, but I've just never been that into the DC side of things. Didn't stop me from loving the Arkham games, mind you, or basically all of the Batman movies, including the shit ones. But yeah, I'm not close to the expanded Gotham universe. So I'm meeting a lot of these characters for the first time. And I got to say of the entire demo experience, the characters and the writing were the parts that I enjoyed the most. 
first. I found all of this kind of fun and novel and refreshing. Perhaps it's because my exposure to Gotham City has been through the singular lens of Batman. His seriousness both in and out of the mask casts a dour pall over everything. That's fine by the way, I love that, but it's nice to be here with these characters adopting a more playful tone and to experience a dynamic between them that isn't just this weird pseudo-sexual flirting thing that Batman seems to have with everyone around him, friend and foe. Why does everyone want to have sex with Batman by the way? Let me know in the comments below. I also quite like the starting point for all of this, which is that Batman is dead. This is a big deal, even to a layperson like myself. I can immediately grasp the significance of that as a jumping off point, and it's clear that the story essentially revolves around that death. The heroes are still grieving him. Villains are still learning that Batman is dead and reacting to it. The remains of his technology are still being sifted through by Alfred, and new discoveries will power advancements in your abilities, like when I inspected the remains of Batman's cape to unlock the glide ability for Batgirl. Batman was also midway through an investigation when he kicked the bucket, and so not only does his death provide a strong emotional catalyst for the game, it provides a strong narrative one as well. The gang are essentially retracing Batman's last steps, piecing together the clues he left behind. That's a crucial part of what Gotham Knights is. It embraces wholesale the detective side of the Bat people. Not only are you being led by the nose from clue to clue, but during missions you're scanning your environments to find hidden clues following trails, collecting and cataloging evidence. One segment had me looking through a workbench to find clues that might open a nearby hidden door, and I had to look for anything that seemed out of place. It was simple, but it was pretty good, and I was into it. So Batman's legacy looms large over every aspect of this game, from its narrative to its gameplay, and it's powerful because, as Kojima said of Snake in Metal Gear Solid 2, and I'm paraphrasing heavily here, but he said something along the lines of, the legend of someone is amplified when you view them through someone else's eyes. If this were just another Batman story, then we'd just be Batman again. But he takes on a more mythic status here in Gotham Knights, as those he left behind mourn his passing, consider his legacy, follow in his life's work, and fight to establish their own identity beyond the long, dark, pointy-eared shadow that unites them. I really like this, and coupled with some pretty good writing and characterization, the thing I'm most excited about when it comes to Gotham Knights is the story. That's mainly because the story is looking pretty good, but also because the rest of the package wasn't as impressive. Gotham Knights is of course set in Gotham City, so by far and away my biggest disappointment with this game is how much of a step down it is visually. Arkham Knight released seven years ago now, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that Arkham Knight looks approximately 8 billion times better than Gotham Knight does. 8 billion. You probably think I'm being hyperbolic, but I mean here's a shot of the Gotham City skyline and some open world gameplay in Gotham Knights. You probably think it looks okay, right? Well, here's Arkham Knight, seven years earlier. Look at this fucking skyline. Look at the density of it, how multi-layered it is. The ambience of the lighting effects, that skybox, that moon, the bat signal. The whole thing is just extraordinary. Hell, look at these fucking water effects in Arkham Knight and compare that to the water effects here seven years later. Okay, look, I don't give a shit about water effects, but what I do care about is art direction, especially in Gotham, because my God, what an artist playground. Like, what are you gonna do with Metropolis or New York City or whatever? They're not very fertile ground for artists. Gotham is gothic, art deco, film noir brought to life. It's idolatry echoing the corruption that both sustains and suffocates it. There is no vision we can hold in our minds of this city in daylight hours because Gotham doesn't exist during the day. It's something else then. It exists only at night. And Rocksteady's artists delivered this brilliant, inspired rendition that felt part real and part fever dream. In contrast, the Gotham of Gotham Knights just looks so pedestrian. This is basically like New York City, almost. I mean, if you took the Bat characters out of this and asked me which city this was, I'd probably guess Gotham, but I wouldn't be 100% certain on that guess. I'd feel like I was kind of rolling the dice. And that's just not something that would have ever happened when it comes to Gotham City in the Arkham games. And it's not just the art design, mind you. The basic density of each space, each character, each enemy, it just feels so much lower than it did in Arkham. Again, if you look at your average fight scene on the streets of Gotham, not a lot to look at. Compare that to Arkham Knight, seven years ago. 
ground clutter, lighting, environmental detail, enemy detail, you name it, there's just more to look at and it all looks better. So look, I did say earlier that I never went into Gotham Knights expecting another Arkham game, but when you've experienced a Gotham City that looks like this, and then you get this seven years later, you're like, wait, what the fuck? Your brain will not be able to avoid that comparison, and it's hard to get it out of your head. This is nothing short of a profound downgrade in art design from a previous iteration of Gotham to this one. And unless there's vast tracts of the city that I haven't yet seen, I think this is going to be a serious body blow to this title. I wish I could tell you that Gotham was more interesting to experience and explore than it is to look at, but that certainly wasn't my experience. To be clear, I only had a limited amount of time with the open world, but every time I did step into it, it felt eerily empty, devoid of people, dynamic events, or hidden nooks and crannies worth exploring. Most of the time when I was there, it was just big, empty, open roads with the occasional cluster of thugs or cops hanging out. I can't recall seeing or finding anything else. I don't want to talk any more about this now because I really didn't get enough time to form a more complete view, but that first impression wasn't great. Most of my time was spent in what were very linear missions. The first with Nightwing, where he was trying to track down some evidence that was kind of a tutorial mission. I moved then onto a new section where I was playing as Batgirl, where I had to first do some open world activities, then I had to make my way through a prison towards Harley Quinn. Finally, I ended my play session with Red Hood, where I had to fight my way through a hospital for a final showdown with Harley Quinn. These missions were all kind of the same. I would be shuttled from room to room and had to beat up bad guys as I did so. There were some of the detective scanning stuff thrown in as well. It was always brief and it did its job as a pacing mechanism. I enjoyed them. They weren't too short as to be pointless, but nor did they wear out their welcome. But yeah, most of the time you go from room to room beating up bad guys. I was okay with that because I actually enjoy the combat mostly. But I was really just in it for the story, to be honest. I was happy going from room to room because I knew that pretty soon I'd be getting the next clue, the next reveal, the next cutscene, the next encounter with an iconic Batman friend or foe. It was very much like Guardians of the Galaxy, which had very middling combat, but I was in it for the story. I don't think the writing here in Gotham Knights is anywhere near as good as that, but it's good enough and it kept me interested and engaged and keen to press on. Even if one of the segments culminates in this prison yard riot, scene set to a remix of Ricky Martin's Livin' La Vida Loco? Take a listen. I guess we should talk now about the combat. So I think the combat in Gotham Knights is pretty good. The melee is all on one button. You quick press it to light attack and you long press to heavy attack. There's a ranged attack, which is different for each character. So Batgirl throws batarangs and Red Hood fires what I assume are non-lethal stun rounds. Otherwise, Batman's gonna be very disappointed in him. There's a dodge button that awards perfect timing with bonus something or other. I can't remember what it's called, but it's the resource that powers your special abilities. And when you charge your bars, you can activate all sorts of stuff like a devastating melee combo or a batarang barrage or this creepy green demon energy bolt stuff that fires from Red Hood's weapons and that can track people. Batgirls is one of the more interesting ones, dropping a little healing drone that will both heal you and your allies, as well as deal damage to nearby enemies. As you would expect, there are lots of upgrades to be unlocked during your playthrough. Each character has four different skill trees that focus on different aspects of their kit, as well as ability unlocks that allow you to specialize in certain playstyles that appeal to you. So in terms of the overall feeling of combat, like I said, it feels pretty good, but again, it's gonna naturally be compared to Arkham. And again, it does kind of fall short. It feels less impactful, less brutal. Visceral is an overused word in video game discourse, but it's pretty apt in describing the difference between Arkham Combat and this. When Batman connected, the screen would shake and action would slow down and enemies would ragdoll, the sound design would thump and boom and thwap and kapow. Wait, sorry, that's Adam West Batman again. Point is, Gotham Knights is doing all of those things here. It just feels a lot more dialed down and dialed back. Part of the reason for that, I think, is that base enemy HP is much higher this time around. Batman could dispatch foes really fast, whereas the Knights probably should have put in a few more bat squats at the bat gym, because they have to beat on basic enemies for a lot longer in order to bring them down, especially so in the case of brute enemies, who just, yeah, they have a lot of health. They're just fucking meat sacks, and they're not fun to fight against. 
They're essentially designed to soak up your ability energy, since beating on them with just basic attacks isn't effective, so you kind of have to drop one of your more powerful abilities on them or combat slows down significantly. I'll make the point though that I was having fun with this combat. I genuinely was. It's simple, but it gets the job done. Each character feels distinct from one another, which I liked. And I think that's going to make for some good pacing since you might find yourself getting a little bored of combat and switching over to a new character for the next mission will spice things up because yes, you can switch characters in between main missions. You are not locked to one character throughout your playthrough. Hard to say how all of this scales into co-op gameplay since my preview was solo only. Co-op is a cool feature and very welcome, but it does seem like a super weird choice to limit this to only two player co-op when you have four heroes. I mean, I know that decision would have had a huge impact on every element of the game, from level design to enemy density and more, but it does seem like it would have been the right call to have made from the outset, so you could build your game around that. I don't think it's a big deal, but it does seem like a weird omission. The other side of the combat equation is the loot game, which, yeah, exists. Okay, so first of all, let's pause. What the fuck is this UI? It, it, it looks like a mobile game, but somehow worse. It's awful. <laughs> I'm going to talk more about immersion in the conclusion, but yeah, opening up this gaudy ass menu with its giant impact type font everywhere really took me out of the experience more than almost any other UI I've experienced before. Anyway, loot game. So your character has three slots, one for your suit, one for your melee weapons, and one for your ranged weapons. The suit does have cosmetic properties, but you can also overwrite that by selecting a different appearance. I don't believe the weapons have cosmetic properties, but don't quote me on that. All of your gear has a level, a rarity. The weapons can have elemental effects like poison or electricity, where successive attacks will eventually apply a status effect. You get this loot by either finding it in chests throughout the world or as a mission reward or by crafting it in your menu. And I don't know, man, this whole thing just seems very reminiscent of the Avengers, which also crudely smushed a loot system into a hero game and that didn't work. And it's the smushing that really doesn't work, by the way. Like you could have had a loot system here that feels more organic. I mean, Batman built all his own shit, right? Crafting unique gadgets is core to the Batman fantasy but you're not crafting unique gadgets here. Those unique gadgets are automatic unlocks in your ability and perk tree. Your gear is a level 13 blue rarity nightstick that has a 5% chance to apply static shock, which can be modded to increase elemental buildup by an additional 5%. I don't know, man, it's, it's pretty goofy. And that kind of brings me to my conclusion around immersion. Now, at the start of this video, I was like, this is not trying to be Arkham, and it's not. And I'm actually 100% okay with that, by the way. I really am. At the same time, it's difficult to get Arkham out of your head when you're playing this because it's a game about Batman, even if he isn't in it, and it's set in Gotham City, and the combat is really similar, etc., etc. When all of this is floating around in your head, you think a lot about what separates this game from the Arkham series. And I think that a commitment to immersion is the starkest point of contrast. Gotham Knights seems uninterested in immersing you in a Bat-person fantasy. Its city looks and feels so generic. Its combat isn't delivering the same cathartic power fantasy. Its UI is very bad, and its loot system feels needlessly shoehorned in. I'm not against anything that this game is aiming at, but I'm not really connecting with any part of it by the story. And had there been a deeper commitment to immersion, to the Bat fantasy, to making me feel like a Bat-person, I suspect I would be a lot more along for the ride than I currently am. I'm still looking forward to this one, to be honest, because I do think that the story will be fun to roll through, and I might play it co-op for some added fun, but as I play through it, I suspect I'll always have Arkham in the back of my mind. Just as Batman looms large over the characters and events in this game, so too does the Arkham series loom large over Gotham Knights. And we'll find out later this month if Gotham Knights is able to get us a little more excited, or if we will remain in mourning for Batman. Like and subscribe. For so long, buying a gaming laptop has usually involved buying some giant slab that requires like three people to carry it. That has changed in the last while, and at the forefront of that evolution has been MSI, who have long delivered a range of high-performance gaming laptops that pack a truly surprising amount of power into a truly surprisingly small form factor. Enter the MSI GP66HX. This thing is fresh out of the oven, featuring a new GPU, CPU, and a redesign resulting in MSI's most space-efficient release yet. The beating heart of this is the NVIDIA RTX 30 series GPU, supporting up to a 3080 Ti for an unpacked 
unparalleled level of performance and fidelity in the games you love to play. I'm talking higher resolutions, higher graphical settings, and higher frame rates than you ever thought possible from a slimline laptop. RTX 30 series GPUs are the ultimate play, not only because of their raw processing power, but also because of their cutting edge features. Games like Gotham Knights support DLSS, which provides a significant frame rate boost depending on the game. And Gotham Knights also supports ray tracing, allowing for a more realistic rendition of lighting and reflections than was ever possible before. Finally, plenty of games support Nvidia Reflex, which reduces input latency for smoother, more responsive performance in games where split second timing really matters. Speaking of smoothness, the screen is a 240 hertz OLED screen. Not only will this allow you to see every single frame being rendered, but it'll show you brighter colors and deeper blacks than other panels because that's the OLED advantage. Equipped with a 12th gen Intel processor and the latest DDR5 RAM, the GP66HX isn't only great for when you're out and about, it also functions brilliantly as a desktop replacement. Plug in up to three additional monitors via HDMI, Thunderbolt and USB-C, and you have a desktop setup that will rival anything a dedicated rig can deliver. To top it all off, the GP66 66HX looks great and it feels really nice to use owing to its tactile RGB backlit keyboard and its large responsive trackpad. This really is the sort of upgrade that's not only great for everything you need now, wherever you want to do it, but it's also going to last because the specs on this thing are so crazy that you're future proofing yourself for at least the next five years of gaming and likely many more than that. If you want to check it out, then click the link below and be sure to check out MSI's full range of laptops to see what they have on offer. Thanks MSI and Nvidia for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.